I appreciate all the uh, speakers that have gone before me today for uh, set, setting everything up. And like Marcus said, I agree pretty much with uh, everything that I've heard. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to review that. I have it in a, in a slide here, I believe, so that you'll uh, know when you can break from this room and get out in the sunshine. I guess I guess that's a problem with hitting last on a day like this. Uh, everybody's gone. Yeah. Uh, much of what I'm going to talk about has to do with uh, how Deborah described uh, my entry into the wine industry. It's going to be the curious case of U.S. Tempranillo, circa 1990. Uh, you're going to taste our Albarino, and Albarino is in position one on your score sheet. Uh, Position five is a wine that I did not provide, but was procured uh, by the staff here at UC Davis. Uh, I uh, don't know to whom to credit that to, but I know Deborah, uh, Nancy, and others were involved in the process. And that is a Sierra Cantabria wine from uh, Rioja Alta. Uh, that wine, in between that will be three Abacella wines. And we make uh, three tiers of Tempranillo on a price point. And the first tier is obviously our lightest wine. It's our introductory Tempranillo wine. Uh, and you'll hear which clones and whatever that's made from later. The middle wine is our estate wine we make every year. And then the third wine in the fourth position on the sheet is our reserve wine, which we make only in the years when we think uh, it's deserved to call it that. Uh, then I'm going to uh, have a little break, you might say, in the presentation, and I want to give you some new information on climate change and how that might modify some of what I will have already said earlier about uh, uh, the climate data. And then I'm going to give some details on Spain's best Tempranillo holocline, as I see it, through the eyes of my son, who's a climatologist uh, at Southern Oregon University. And this, uh, these two points will be the only science in my talk. The rest of it will be mostly a saga. And finally, I'm going to finish with going back and revising two or three important historical events to fit the ideal world. And finally, then I'm going to give you a view of what I see the future to be. So, I'm from Abacella in the southwest of Oregon. Uh, we bought the land there, moved 2,700 miles from back east uh, in 1993-94, planted our grapes in 95, and we started out with Tempranillo and Garnacha among the things that we now uh, bottle with that varietal name on the label. We planted port varieties starting in 1997, and we planted uh, Albarino in 2000. So now that with an orientation, I'm from the Umpqua Valley AVA. I'm in the southern part of that AVA. It uh, spans about one uh, degree latitude, and I'm in the southern part that has a uh, climate that currently uh, the last 10 year running average is about 27 to 2900 heat units a year. Uh, Winkler heat units in Fahrenheit. Now let's go back to that curious case of Tempranillo uh, circa 1990. I picked 1990 because that was when I made my decision to uh, I guess that was the year I had my midlife crisis and wanted to do something different. Uh, and Spanish cuisine and wine was gaining a new kind of recognition. In the 70s, uh, the Michelle, uh, Miguel Torres family uh, garnered considerable attention for stainless steel incorporation, modernizing uh, their industry that all of Spanish uh, wine industry was following the wines began to get a lot higher reviews. Uh, in the early 80s, uh, some of the now legendary re restaurants were, uh, even an ordinary person could go to them then, uh, and have very special cuisine. And the epicenter of the world's 
food interests began to move to Iberia. Uh, in 1986, uh, Alejandro uh, Fernandez's Pescara was reviewed by Robert Parker. Uh, and this was not just technology. This was a grape that was grown in the right place and it made a great wine. And this attracted the attention of not only me, but lots of other people in the new world. And we began to ask ourselves, you know, what was going on? Uh, First thing I wanted to do was, as I had done in comparing Bordeaux's and Burgundy's, was taste something from the New World. I tried to find it. It wasn't being bottled. There was no American, when I say American, I was unable to find anything from the New World, the New America, from Argentina, uh, Chile, uh, uh, or the USA, that was called or dated Tempranillo. Uh, so how could I evaluate the Spanish wines? Now, this was very interesting given the, uh, it seemed to me, uh, you know, I was a, a, a neophyte. I certainly didn't know that. I thought Rioja might be a grape. I didn't know for sure. Uh, but it seemed that most grape varieties that had been tried could be grown in the New World successfully. So it was very puzzling. I, I, I didn't understand. And that curiosity uh, began to drive my interest. I went back and took a, took a look at best I could from the libraries, and uh, the, you might recall there was no internet at that time. Uh, and I, I could finally f figure out that during Spain's golden age, from roughly the time Columbus left to find the New World uh, until about 1650, that 150, 160, 70 years, was Spain's golden era. And during that time, it, there's no evidence that I could come by that, that Tempranillo was offered to the American colonies, nor was it planted in the Americas by that, during that time interval. Uh, the New World colonials were disappointed in what they did get from Mother Spain, the mission grapes. And when I say disappointed, they needed wine. I understand that, and for that they were grateful. But they really wanted the proven German and French varietals, cherry maybe, and maybe even port in the later years. Uh, so finally, Argentina acquired something it liked. Malbec and uh, Tarantes. Now, did, where did Tarantes come from? Well, it may have been one of those mission grapes. Not all of the mission grapes were the same. Some were Listan Prieto, as we've, as we've heard earlier today. Uh, some were muscats, and some were hybrids, seed hybrids. It looks like as much of, uh, as 27% uh, of the 79 cultivars that were analyzed in that study that I read a couple of years ago that was a multi-institutional uh, study uh, were actually hybrids. Uh, so maybe Trantes was one of those hybrids. Uh, Chile selected the grapes of Bordeaux. California eventually gathered in a great handful of things that it, one, it called its own, Zinfandel, uh, the Bordeaux, the Burgundies, etc. Uh, but, you know, all of that notwithstanding, by the mid 1600s, the Mission grapes were still the dominant grape in what is now the USA. That's New Mexico and El Paso, Texas. Now, the, uh, where's that pointer? The uh, first grapes coming into California came up this way with uh, Father uh, Unipato Serra and uh, uh, Portola, Gaspar Portola. Uh, but grapes also moved on this pathway. Wine moved on that pathway. It was a very interesting time in history. Now let's focus a little bit later. We don't have to go too much later. As it's already been pointed out today, these, these grapes came in to California. By 1833, down in the Los Angeles area, a Frenchman by the name of Jean-Louis Vignes was planting uh, good French grapes. But they didn't dominate for a long time. Charles Krug made it abundantly clear in 1858 that the Mission grape was still dominant. Some people think it dominated to maybe 1880-something. 
The first Tempranillo that I can find any record of came to the uh, New World. Now, there's some may have come to Argentina or Chile before that, but I have not, other than the internet searches, been able to dig into the history of that in great depth. But it arrived, as been said earlier, at the Jacksonville Experimental Station. Uh, the first Tempranillo came with Tinta Cow and uh, I forget what else. But that was uh, a hundred years after there were people here on the west coast of what is today the USA growing grapes. Uh, by Letty, uh, who has a street name for him here just a block or so away, uh, advocated that Tempranillo be grown in the Central Valley. There were good reasons for that. Uh, it was planted there. It did well there. There were extensive field trials conducted with Tempranillo in California. Those were interrupted by prohibition. They were interrupted by various other things. Uh, for the Europeans here, if you could uh, just fathom what it meant for prohibition, which really came on in the teens, it was a law in 1921 and lasted to 1933. It really tore up the development of, of the wine industry in this, in this world, in our country. But anyway, these field trials that were going on were, and I've looked at that data, they made the right conclusions. Uh, they thought the wines were ordinary, often unstable, due to the high pH issues, which you've already heard about today. And they couldn't justify recommending widespread planting of the Tempranillo grape. I'm not sure, you, as you're going to hear in my speculations about some revised history later, uh, that that was uh, necessarily, uh, I, I believe it was the correct decision for the data. I'll come back to it later. The Tempranillo bulk wine model that went on in the Central Valley was very effective. Uh, as of 1990, there were 533 acres of Tempranillo planted in the Central Valley. Uh, that model worked. It was a financial success. And ultimately, that's the measure of whatever we do with grapes in our vineyards and wines in our winery. If it doesn't work financially, people want, want to continue to grow it. Now, let's look at Tempranillo production models in Spain. That's what I did at that point in my history. Uh, and I looked at their fine wine model. It was pretty obvious that it, the fine wine principally had come for 100 years from Rioja. Ribera del Duero was now getting a lot of play. Uh, uh, and to the outsiders like me, it appeared that the only production model in Spain was fine wine, in contrast to what was being done in the U.S. In, re in reality, in Spain, there was a lot of Tempranillo, or very similar species, and I use that term uh, in the very liberal, broad brush stroke sense. I recognize that many of that is probably synonyms for the same vine or similar vines. They were grown, uh, as I believe the word has been used, all over Spain. Uh, but it wasn't clear to me uh, where and if they did have a bulk wine industry. So I began to uh, go back to Spain. I'd been over there twice before in earlier years, so I went back trying to answer some of these questions. Uh, just a few of the synonyms I copied off of uh, uh, I, just amazing number of uh, regional terms for the Tempranillo grape. In looking at this map of Spain, I want to quickly put on here the two premier uh, Tempranillo growing areas. Uh, they're in the elevated Maceta of the center of Spain. Uh, they're the premium areas. Now in contrast, what I was able to find when I was in Spain, that La Mancha could make good wines, but it really made a lot of quantity over quality overall. And in the same sense, they were doing the same, uh, much the same with Tempranillo in uh, Valencia. I noticed that there was a very different protocol in Catalonia and Priorat and Umilia. There, uh, Tempranillo was being used as a minor blending partner. So it became obvious to me that there was something going on. And I think what that is, is this is a very hot climate. And I think that we have polar examples here of the fine wine producing areas and a very hot climate effect on uh, growing that grape in Spain. So these models, the fine wine model, 
All fruit was grown on the high elevations and the distinctive climate of the interior. The bulk wine model, the fruit was grown at high tonnages in a longer, war warmer growing season climate. And then the third model, which was not in the U.S. at all, was a blending model, uh, where uh, a premium grape such as uh, uh, Monasterel, or maybe multiple grapes as in Priorat, or maybe uh, one of the international grapes like Cabernet, uh, in Catalonia was being blended with small amounts of Tempranillo. Now, let's take a look. Let's drill down, if you would. This is what I was trying to do. And look at the uh, La Rioja and Ribera at their quality factors. So I, I drove it. I tried not to stop at the large producers. I tried to stop at the small producers who could tell me that, yeah, I grew the fruit right there on that hill, brought it into the winery so that I could understand the relationship between place and taste. Uh, and going through uh, both uh, areas, most of the people said that their quality factor was their soil. Most of the people in both regions claimed that it was their winemaker. Most people in both locales, again, claimed elevation. But like with soil, there were multiple elevations, ranging in Rioja from around 1,000 feet in elevation to in the Ribera almost 3,000 feet in elevation. So how could it be elevation per se or soil per se? Now, when I talked in more general terms, uh, and asked the people in Rioja where, they, where their best fruit was really coming from. They said, well, it's coming uh, not from Rioja Baja, but from Rioja Alta uh, Alviesa. Little, uh, little higher elevation with cooler climate up there. When I talked to the people in the Ribera, I got the same directions with the opposite meaning. They said east of Aranda, you tend to make very good rosés west of Aranda is where you get the best red wine fruit. Uh, between there, or around uh, Pinafael, all the way out to uh, Valladolid. So what was all this meaning? Now I made this little cartoonish map again to try to make a couple of points. What they're saying was that Tempranillo didn't do as well in the Baja of Rioja, which I X'd out as it did in the western Rioja. Tempranillo didn't do as well in the eastern part of the Ribera as it did in the western part. Now we're going to start drilling down on climate. Here we are, we have uh, four temperature curves for four sites bookending the areas that we've been speaking of. Now, El Faro is way down here. They have a, a growing season uh, that's longer and has a, quite a bit more heat in it than they do in uh, Cuscarita on the Rio Tiran, which is located up here. Now, if this area is pretty much out of the question for a primary Tempranillo zone, then let's zero in on that. And I'm going to remove that Alfaro climate, and we're going to, to be zeroed in now from about La Grano to uh, Coscorita. Now, let's do the same thing with, La, uh, with the Ribera del Duero. There I've added the bookend locations of La Vid, which is about eight or ten miles east of Aranda, and Valladolid, which is just outside the uh, Dio on the west side. And you see their curves. These growing degree day curves from the, for the 1960 to 1990 time period form a close-knit family. I was pleased to see that. Something was making sense. Now, that's the two zones. So what I did is, for today's discussion, averaged those sites. I kind of suspicion that my data 
for uh, for uh, Auro is something's wrong with it because uh, it looks like it's different than everything else. But let's a minor wrinkle. Let's leave it in there. So I average the data, and this to me then becomes the Tempranillo Rioja Ribera Holoplan. Now let's compare that in this next slide with some much warmer uh, sites. And I've put in Valencia, as I commented about that earlier. You can see that it has a much longer growing season. Uh, bud break occurs much earlier. The fruit is ripening during a much hotter part of the year in Valencia. That's not so different than in Fresno. Alfaro is kind of intermediate, and uh, La Mancha is, follows the pattern of Alfaro, more of a continental type curve. So now let's take a look at some classic Cabernet Merlot climates. And I've pulled up three that I thought were pretty good that I could, I could get good data on back then. And they are uh, Napa, and this is St. Helena. And this is uh, Bordeaux, and I don't remember what town it comes from, but this is not a vineyard site. This is a town site, as, as all of these stations are. And this is Carneros. And you can see that all of these climates have a uh, significant maritime effect that extends the growing season and blunts the summer heat, whereas a continental climate makes a hotter uh, portion in here. So what is this beginning to look like? This next slide is going to shock, shock you, perhaps. What the climate of Rioja and Ribera really models after is Burgundy. Not exactly, of course. Burgundy's cooler, and you're going to hear much more about that in a little bit. Uh, the summer T-maxes, which are much hotter in a continental climate that doesn't have humidity and has clear skies, uh, is, is considerably greater, and then it remains warmer during the ripening period. But that's an interesting perspective. Now, let's, let's take that Rebo uh, uh, Ribera Rioja Holoclam, and let's try to characterize it just a notch further. In the Russian, or the German, I guess, rather, uh, uh, classification, of Dr. Copen, that's a CSB climate. Continental, uh, hot summers uh, with little rain in the summer, pretty dry. Has a Winkler, Winkler growing degree days in Fahrenheit of about 2,600 units. That's about 1450 centigrade. Clear, sunny summer days and cool nights with a high daily T max. It doesn't occur now in a maritime climate. It has a wide diurnal temperature swing. That doesn't occur in a maritime climate. It has modest growing season rain. That's one of the reasons they could grow the fruit there. It has a relative short autumn. And I began to fixate on that when I was going through this data back in 1988, 90, 91, 92 along in there, I thought that with this short growing period grape that Tempranillo represents, uh, that must be pretty critical to have it ripen at the right time of the year to match so it doesn't burn up the acids and take away the fruit. By the way, th there's wine in front of you. Uh, uh, don't be bashful. Start tasting it. Uh, that that Albarino is going to warm up. Uh, Go ahead and get some of that going. We, we'll, you know, we can always talk about the numbers later. Okay, so here I was, uh, a long way from anywhere that I thought I could grow Tempranillo. Uh, what was I going to do? I had this theory. Uh, so I, with my midlife crisis, my wife and I decided to uh, find a climate in America that resembled that in Spain. We spent a long time looking and we settled in the southwest of Oregon, as you've already heard. Uh, we named our little project uh, from a uh, 
uh, a Iberian word, and I use that rather than uh, say it belongs to any one country, because the word is probably today used more in Portuguese or in Gallegan in Galicia than it is in Spain. But people know the word in the western part of Spain, certainly in Zamora and Toro. Uh, it derived from a stick, a rod in Latin, if you would. And in the early days, uh, the, the rod could be given action and made into a verb to plant or to heal in, to plant temporarily more, maybe more accurately would be the way to use the word. Uh, and so I, at the age of um, uh, 52, became a grape grower and a winemaker. I didn't know which end of the grape to stick in the ground. Uh, some, some other comments here. Uh, Spain, uh, the, the uh, Ribera is about 41 degrees north latitude. Southern Oregon is 42 degrees north latitude. In other words, the upper, upper limit of California. The northernmost area in Spain is about 44 degrees. And the northernmost that we farm it in Oregon is about 43, maybe 43.3, something like that. So interestingly, it turns out we're on about the same latitude. But I never, I, excuse me, I never thought about that when I was looking for the land. Uh, and I think uh, there's plenty of reasons to think that you probably couldn't grow it here on the East Coast at the same latitude. So it has to do with prevailing wind patterns, ocean temperatures, uh, the presence of mountain ranges. I'm inside the coastal range, which is what protects me from the water, from the rain. The orographic effect of that coastal range gives me a dry climate in the summer. I have rain in the winter, but that rain is long gone by the time my shoots are any size. Uh, in Spain, we talk of a continental climate. It's really a peninsula climate with a high meseta giving it a continental aspect because of the elevation. Uh, many people in Spain said Tempranillo only grows well at high elevations. That's only true in Spain because there it takes the high elevation like a mountain makes its climate. It takes the high elevation to make the climate that that grape was selected to grow in over the millennia. That's where the fit comes. It's not the high elevation per se. I'm sure you understand that. Uh, but in this idea of continentality, this is real continentality. It's like comes out what out of out of what comes out of Russia. There, the temperatures go low, 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 and that turns out to be a very important problem here. Tempranillo, as Marcus said, is cold hardy for frost, but it's not cold hardy at minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 days. And they found that out, as they have with certain other uh, vitis vinifera in the state of Washington. Uh, you, you, ha you can't put them on grafted rootstocks. The cold will kill everything down to the graft, and then you're left with a rootstock. So even where I am, I buy that extra insurance by planting a little bit of everything I grow on its own roots, small percent, 5%, 8%. So anyway, uh, I started looking in New Mexico, I looked in Colorado, Idaho, Washington, etc. And I wanted to get out where there's enough maritime effect to moderate my climate. That's how I got to Oregon. Uh, here we are, the coastal range is in this area. When those big uh, Arctic freezes come down, this is the Walla Walla area where they uh, will often lose a vintage. And if they're on grafted vines, lose their vines because of that severe, deep, protracted winter freeze. Uh, that sometimes spills over into the Portland area, down in the Willamette Valley, but it rarely ever comes down here. As, as you go south from me into the Rogue Valley of Southern Oregon, which is also part of the Southern Oregon AVA, there the temperatures can get pretty low also. Probably not enough to lose all their Tempranillo vines, but enough to scare you. That just shows you that uh, that CSB climate again that you heard. Uh, here
here's the uh, precipitation pattern for summer, uh, comparing a 10-year rolling rainfall in millimeters uh, for Oregon and Bayou de Lead. Uh, this data came from the 1990s, uh, and you can see that the lighter blue represents uh, my valley. We tend to get a larger percentage of our rain in the early spring, and typically right after harvest. Whereas the rain in uh, at Bayou de Lead tends to be spread more evenly over the growing season. This is a, a picture of uh, one of my vineyards. Let me see why I put that in there. Yeah, I put it in there to talk about Albarino. Uh, but I want to go back to it. Uh, this is a south-facing hillside, very steep slope. These are the Albarino vines in the foreground. And for some reason, I don't ever photograph them, but they are on a hill that slopes to the north. I took that precaution. I, I don't think it's necessary, but I tried to keep them out of the kind of intense heat that we get on a hillside like that by just using my real estate on the north side to which I had nothing planted. Also, it enables me to keep my the temperature down. Probably, I know that I have a weather station on the flat areas and weather stations on the south face of the hill. The weather station on the south face of the hill tends to be about five to nine degrees warmer than on a flat zone on the same day. Inversions at night maintain the temperature on the, on the slope. On the north side of a hill, I think the temp, I've not monitored well, but I think the temperature is about two to three degrees lower than it is on a flat site. And irrespective of the te ambient temperature of the air, the temperature of the fruit because it doesn't get very much sunshine on that shaded North Hill, is much cooler. I believe that you may can taste that bright acid in my Albarino as a product of that. Now, a little bit about our Albarino. Uh, we planted it in 2000. Uh, we've planted on a steep north slope. We only planted a little bit because we didn't think it would work. Uh, we made 10 cases in 2001 uh, for recreation, I guess you might say. I would never made a glass of the stuff and I wondered what it would be like. It would uh, clean the enamel on your teeth. It was incredible. Uh, uh, the acid was beautiful. Uh, the fruit was great. It was very encouraging. So we began to plant expansion blocks, always on the north slopes. We had that av available real estate. Uh, the wine got a very favorable review from Jancis Robinson uh, in uh, 2004. We planted more in 2006, plant, planting the Portuguese clone that's now at UC Davis. Uh, we uh, did some further graft overs and new blocks in 07. Today we're farming about 10 acres of Albarino with the two cultivars mentioned. And all of it is on a north or northeast sloped block of land. Now, how do we handle our Albarino? It's all planted on rotor row spacing at 10 feet. We do that because we farm some pretty steep hills, and if it's on a side hill, that's pretty uh, exciting to drive a tractor on. So I'd rather have a wider stance tractor and live longer as a more uh, modern concepted vineyard and die earlier. Uh, we plant at about five foot spacing. We've experimented with uh, a little closer and a little wider. We like it about there. Uh, we have it on its own roots and we have it on 4453. We really like that rootstock in our soil. Our soils are derived from uh, ancient uh, Klamath Mountain serpentine. They're very high in magnesium, uh, very uh, low in calcium. They're very, you know, the reason they call serpentine rock serpentine is it said that only snakes grow there. Uh, the, uh, my soils uh, afford about that much growth, but 4453 rootstock is a uh, uh, interesting uh, vine. It's, uh, it would be deficient of magnesium in a normal soil, but on a magnesium rich soil, it's a great rootstock. 
And so it's my workhorse, a rootstock. I use it for lots of things. Uh, as you've heard earlier, Albarino has a tendency to form these long inner nodes, and it can be a problem. There's many ways of uh, dealing with that. We've chosen to do what we call double caning. Uh, in other words, for a standard plant, it gets four canes, two in each direction. Uh, we get a lot of buds, of course, but that enables us to space those buds just like we want. We go back and space them about every three to four inches by just flicking off the ones we don't want. Uh, otherwise, uh, we would get into a bigger uh, cascade and we'd have to keep trying to find other ways of controlling that. So this enables us to bring up our crop load, which lets it ripen a little later in the year, and I like the effect that has on Albarino. Phenology-wise, it bud breaks pretty early, around the 1st of April. Uh, it flowers first week of June. I mean, these are weeks. I just tried to get as close as I could. Yeah, it uh, uh, begins to soften up uh, first, second week of, uh, of uh, August, and we usually harvest it the third week of September. Now, interestingly, by cropping it up and getting to where the vine is struggling a little bit and pushing the irrigation on those vines, not letting them dry out, not letting those roots uh, signal total ripening, we can get it to hang to the first week of October. We've only been able to do that one time but I believe we now know how, uh, and I, that's a real breakthrough. I think uh, we're going to be able to, to have nicer acids and a longer hang time and a better set of aromatics. What you're tasting today is that product from 2008. We target crop level at about three to five tons. Uh, some blocks will give us the five, some blocks will give us the three. We've got one block on a very cobbly, uh, uh, sandy loam that uh, gives us about two and a half, and that's all I can beat out of it. Uh, we leaf pull on the east side, and we have some rows that run east-west, and we leaf pull on the north side of that to try and get a little uh, more sunlight in there. Uh, we pick it by taste. Uh, we've, we have had it up to where it's 13.5% alcohol. Uh, that was coming off that little block that's on that uh, awful rocky soil. Uh, we, we like to get it where it's about like it is this year, uh, around 13.1, 13.2 alcohol. Great acid. Uh, we crush it. Uh, we settle it overnight. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, let me back up one notch. We crush it and let it soak on its skins overnight. We don't see any bitters in our skins, uh, whereas we do with Viognier, another white grape we make. Uh, and, and we like the effect that that gives us. We ferment it cold very slowly. It takes us almost two months to bring that thing dry. Uh, and uh, we do that in stainless. We wouldn't think of oak with it. It would disrupt the aromatics. We batonize the leaves in, or maybe I should say we pump over the leaves and with a kind of a strange device my winemakers come up with, uh, but it seems to uh, uh, do something good for the mouthfeel. This is a, uh, I look uh, down one of my Tempranillo vineyards, uh, looking out to the west uh, sometime in midsummer. No, it's Verasian. I can see some purple fruit hanging over there. And this is just to punctuate to say that we're getting ready to talk about Tempranillo. At Abasolo, we have eight cultivars of Tempranillo. I'm not going to spend much time on this slide. You can see the Davis numbers. They're one, two, and then the V stands for Valdepinas, and then the TR1 stands for Tinta Roris, uh, 12, 5, 11, and, and 6 you've heard about today or you have it in your handout. We've never made wine from Clone 6, obviously. We'll get a little bit this coming year, probably enough for you know, maybe five, five or ten cases. It'll just be that part we always try to try to make to learn from. Uh, we planted our first Tempranillo in 1995. Uh, this was Tempranillo with three clones. We planted clone one. And by the way, that clone is no longer available. We got that clone from an experimental station in Southern Oregon that got it here from Davis. I have the uh, paperwork on that. 
Uh, we also planted clone two and then the Valdepinas clone that year. Uh, we bottled our first uh, 400 cases of wine in 1997. Uh, our 1998 wine won the 2001 San Francisco International Wine Competition, besting 19 Spanish Tempranillos. Uh, we we're very proud of that. We began to plan expansion blocks because we could see that we had verification, that we were on to something that worked. We planted our fourth cultivar, which was Tinto Roriz that year. Our fifth cultivar, uh, which was uh, clone... Uh, uh, 12, I believe it is. Then in 2006, we planted two more of the uh, clones from uh, Spain, and then uh, we planted the clone six this past year. We farm about 20 acres of Tempranillo in multiple soils, multiple aspects, and slopes. Now, a little bit about how we grow it and how we make wine with it. Uh, we plant it at 10 foot uh, row to row spacing. The plant spacing now with this one, you guys are gonna fully appreciate that I'm nuts. We have Tempranillo planted as close together as six inches, one foot, two feet, three feet. Uh, it, it's a great, uh, if, if, you, if you've ever been to Abasala, you need to walk down those rows and take a look at what's happened since uh, they were planted that way. It's a very interesting study in plant to plant competition. Uh, we've settled on somewhere between five and eight feet. Uh, we have recently planted uh, a small block, one acre of Tinta Pais, uh, at three feet into row spacing. Uh, we would like to try to see those clusters a little smaller. We don't know if we'll get there or not. We just planted it this spring. Rootstock-wise, we planted it on a lot of things. Our favorites are 4453 and 420A. 10114 is not bad either. We've tried goblet vines, a Silvas system, which doesn't work worth a hoot. For Tempranillo, it's too upright. Works okay for Syrah and some other things. Uh, we've had some Scott Henry with it. We didn't like that. And we've settled on VSP as our workhorse trellis. We prune uh, uh, to both a cordon and a spur. Uh, some, some cultivars or clones get one, some another. We particularly like our clone one uh, on canes. That enhances its fruitfulness a little bit. We try to crop it all about three to four tons to the acre. Uh, we don't always get that. Sometimes we get more, sometimes we get less. Phenologically speaking, it bud breaks uh, uh, fairly late. Uh, flower is kind of middle of the pack. Uh, and then it uh, raises uh, pretty early, about the earliest thing we have. And then we harvest it uh, pretty early. I'm a little surprised at how early it comes in at Abasala. I don't think we've ever picked Tempranillo, even at five tons to the acre, uh, later than that fourth week or maybe the first few days of October. Uh, typically, uh, the Malbec is coming in then uh, the Merlot, uh, Syrah, so that just kind of put it into perspective. We pick it by taste. Uh, we have gone through the same agony, and I use that word like Marcus did, of trying to figure out what to do with the uh, dropping acid and the rising pHs. Uh, we uh, destem it, we cold soak it, we small batch ferment it usually. We do some in stainless steel tanks, but the largest tank we have is four tons. Uh, so fundamentally, most of it is made in one ton batches. Uh, we do manual punch downs. We use a basket press. We tank settle. It's all done by gravity. We're three levels in our winery. And uh, we take it uh, when it's still got quite a bit of set uh, lees into the barrel. Uh, we inoculate malic in the fermenter. So Malik is roaring by the time it goes into barrel. We try to get that over as quickly as we can and then adjust pH again. We bottle it uh, quite late. We tend, tend to uh, believe very much like the Spanish that it needs some time in the barrel. Uh, so we keep it our youngest wine, the Cuvée, uh, spent 17 months in barrel. The oldest, uh, the, our reserve wine in position number four, 
uh, spins, we bottle it just right before the next harvest. Uh, we uh, barrel it in French oak for most part, but as you can tell by smelling our wines, we don't oak it very heavily. We use some American oak, probably about 10, 15 percent American oak. We've even tried American oak in which the staves were cut in this country and shipped to Spain to be air dried, made into barrels over there, and we bring the barrels back over here. Interestingly, it tastes more like Spanish wine. So there's something to do with the effect of air drying on the stave or its coopering that influences wine taste. Uh, the uh, Tempranillo Im improves almost e immediately, within six months, eight months in the bottle, and then it improves greatly in the cellar. A Tempranillo at about its seventh or eighth year is a delight. That's when they should be drunk. Unfortunately, they were all drunk 24 to 48 hours after they were purchased, but uh, anyway, that's the, rea that's, the, that's the real story of Tempranillo. We produce it in three quality tiers, and, and to just a couple of comments about that, let me see if I can find any way to do Yeah, I got it here on the slide. The 2006 Cuvée, that's one in position two, is principally uh, cultivar uh, number two, Davis nomenclature. It's got uh, a quite, quite a bit of Aldepenas in it, and it's got some clone 12. Uh, it's grown in a very cobbly loam on that steep hill that that picture was taken where I, where I noticed the, the uh, verasion that occurred. Uh, and it tends to make a redder wine when grown in that kind of a soil. It makes a, a darker wine in a clay loam, in my opinion, although I don't think I could guarantee that and deliver it next year. Uh, you know, every year, every vintage is a little different, but I believe that's a fundamental. Uh, the middle, uh, this is the wine we make every year, and our best typically comes out of a sandy loam block called Southeast Block. Uh, this reserve was made from a clay loam block in the southwest of that same vineyard, uh, and it's always clone one. That's the one that does us the best. It suffers from inflorescence necrosis in the spring, so that's a variable crop. We've brought in as high as five and a half tons to the acre. We've brought in as little as 1.75 tons to the acre. My banker doesn't like that, but my wife loves to drink it when it comes in at that level. Fabulous wine. Uh, talking about our hills, that's one of them. Uh, it's a remarkably, uh, a remarkable piece of real estate. Uh, right across here is where the fault line goes that separates 400 million year old terrain from 25,000 year old terrain. That's as close as I've ever been to on, on, owning oceanfront property. Now, we're going to get into a little bit of science, and we're going to take that science back to see how it looks uh, with regard to some of those 1990 drill down on Tempranillo issues. This all comes from my son, who's a professor at Southern Oregon, and his colleagues and these papers are in press. Uh, he told me it was fine for, for me to uh, give him that much credit and, and uh, tell you about it. Uh, climate change is going on probably always is. This one is getting warmer. Uh, this one is characterized by an increase in the T-min of the nighttime temperature. It's, it's altering at a rate of about twice that of the T-max, which is the daytime temperature. And it accounts for most of the temperature change observed in all of the wine grape growing areas of the world. And in particular, he focused on the Ribera del Duero, uh, Burgundy, and Umqua for us here today because of that drill down on the climate I'm trying to do for you. The increase in Tmax in those three areas was greatest in the Ribera, greater than in the Umqua, and I didn't have room enough to write Burgundy. Uh, the warming has increased the growing degree days from since, since those 1990 uh, 30-year rolling averages that I used uh, back along 20 years ago almost uh, by about 110 to 165 uh, centigrade Winkler heat units. And that's pretty consistent uh, with what I see in the Umqua. Uh, we, uh, 
we thought we had a climate of about 2,600 heat units, and it's really somewhere between 27 and 29, rolls around a little bit every year, of course. Uh, there's been a concurrent delay and uh, decline, I mean, in the number of days below freezing within the growing season and actually within the off season in the winter area. In other words, we now have a longer growing season and a milder winter. There's been no significant change in precipitation. That's what he says. Uh, this past summer, we only had 3.1 inches of rain uh, between March 31st and November the 1st. Uh, I don't know how many years that has to happen in a row before that becomes significant. Uh, but that on my cobbly soils, which the water runs through, is a difficult farming problem. Now, let's go back and take a revisit to that uh, uh, Ribera del Duero Tempranillo Holocline using the PRISM modeling technology. Now, you heard me say earlier that those, those data sites for Roseburg, uh, Valladolid, uh, Lagrano, wherever, are weather station sites. They typically give a higher number than a vineyard site because they're urbanized. Often the weather station itself is on concrete. Often it's near a building where there's reflected light and it's in an urban setting where that is going on over the whole area. So when we think of these numbers, they don't necessarily apply to out where you grow your grapes in the field and where I grow my grapes. And that's what this PRISM technology models. It takes the known weather station numbers and generates data based on kilometer square units gridded over the growing area. Understand that? what it's saying. Now if we do that and we go back and look at what I was comparing earlier, the Ribata and Burgundy, and I'm just using abbreviations here and I'll try to kind of catch you up as I go down this list. This is Winkler growing degree days. The Ribera is a little warmer using this 50 year rolling data than, uh, than the Umqua data, but it's cooler, if you can do the translations in your head, uh, than the numbers that I presented you earlier. That's because your, this data is modeled on the vineyards in the DO, not on the weather station in Bayou de Lead or Aranda. Okay? Uh, Burgundy is a little cooler. Now, this is the Hugelin Index which takes into account uh, some other variables, and uh, we can't begin to go into that today. Uh, but it's, it says, much like the biological equivalent degree day effect, that the Umqua has a little broader growing range, maybe. And from my experience in visiting uh, with people in the Ribera del Duero, I believe that's true, because we can routinely uh, mature Malbec uh, Grenache, uh, Syrah, Petit Verdot uh, in our AVA, whereas that is more difficult here. So this must be a, a more relevant number, perhaps. Uh, if you look at the growing season T average, they're all pretty close. If you look at the uh, cold night index, look how cold it is up there in Oregon. Why is it that way? It's because we have a large store of cold called the Pacific Ocean, which is 50 degrees and the wind's blowing in over it. It comes up over our coastal mountains, takes the moisture out of it, but doesn't warm it up at night. There's no sun, and so we have very cold nights. So as we move into the uh, ripening period, this becomes a great uh, issue. And if you look at the, the diurnal uh, temperature range, Look at the number we have here, very much like in the Ribera and Burgundy, which is bathed in a lot more humidity, which is what this, uh, this is the dryness index uh, experiences. Uh, the Ribera is slightly drier than the Umqua. So this just helps you uh, drill down on that again and gives you more than growing, growing degree days. 
So now I'm going to summarize here, try to get us out of this place. Uh, I want to do a revision of history. I only want to revise two things. I want Spain to send its very best grapes to its colonies during its golden era of the 14s to 1650s. Think what that would have meant to the New World. Uh, what would Argentina be growing today? What would uh, Chile be growing today? What would we be growing today in the U.S. state that has more place names with Spanish uh, uh, influence than any other location? Perhaps it wouldn't be Zinfandel. Perhaps it would be some of these grapes of Spain. Perhaps those grapes of Spain that came to the U.S., with French nomenclature because they came from the south of France, like Carignan, like Grenache, uh, et cetera, would be called, uh, uh, you know, Carigna and Garnacha and Monasterel, et cetera. Uh, we don't know. That didn't happen. But that's one revision that would be interesting. The second would be to go back to those studies that were started by Bialetti and were finished off in the 1960s by Amarine and Winkler and redo those California Temp Tempranillo field trials. Now, I told you earlier, I'd looked at, I've looked at the data, and I believe it was done correctly. But I think it was a product of its time. Today, people in California plant in cooler areas. People weren't planting in Monterey, from, to my knowledge, or the Santa Rita Hills, or the Santa Lucia Highlands back in those years. I haven't exhaustively gone through the data. I might be incorrect, but I'm throwing this out as a revision of history for you to help analyze. I'd recommend that those trials include something other than Valdepinas. You saw earlier that I like clone one a lot. You saw that I also like clone 12. And you saw that I like the new clone, uh, I think it's called clone 11, the Toro clone. Uh, what would these have done in those trials, in those years, in those locations? Uh, I'd like for the trials to be done over where they would make the necessary tartaric acid adjustments for the pH. That might I don't know how, how long tartaric acid has been available. I don't know how long that's been done. I've not had a chance to investigate that thoroughly enough. But I'm just throwing this out as a quick review, a revision of history. I'd like to see the elevage have been done in a barrel, not in a, some sort of slick wall tank or a carboy. I'd like to see the trial wines bottled for a while before they were tasted. And then, of course, since I'm at the business of it, let's assume that prohibition never happened. Now, let's get around to looking into the future a little. And that's tougher. First off, no two regional climates are exactly alike. How big is a regional climate? Is it X miles by X miles or X degrees of latitude and longitude? No, it's whatever Mother Nature says that regional climate is. Now, in my own vineyard, from one place on a hillside to another, and that's almost microclimate, certainly mesoclimate level, I don't think things are quite the same. So I don't believe that if I took the same cultivar to virtually identical climates, that it would grow the same way and make the same kind of wine. So let's don't extrapolate too far from what I've drilled down on and shared with you today. But let's keep trying. Uh, we're at a wonderful time in history. We have the bountiful riches of all of the cultivars and clones from Iberia that are now coming to the New World four to five hundred years after the time that I personally believe they should have. Everyone's entitled to an opinion on that, I guess. Uh, what's the future going to hold with possibly as many as uh, what do we hear today? Maybe 600, 800 different uh, genetic identities uh, of wine grapes 
on that one peninsula? There's no telling what we may discover in the myriad of climates that we have in the New World, that we have in California, Oregon, Washington, Arizona, you know, everywhere. Who would have thought that an obscure grape from Croatia would have become California's darling and made very special wine as Zinfandel? Who would have thought that Kat from Cohurs would make such wonderful wine in Argentina? It does. We can't deny that. Who would have thought that Sauvignon Blanc from the Loire could ever have been done better? But I believe New Zealand has. I think there are three examples with three grape cultivars, and I don't want to push that any further, that the New World, with the lack of regulation, lack of law, and new climates with new nuances, have been able to make better wines than the same grape did in its motherland. I think we have that possible possibility here with some of these Iberian grapes, and that's a very a very exciting time. And then uh, today, climate is warming. But climate always changes. You can look back, you know, scientists look at the Greenland ice core. It's been changing since before recorded history. We're just in a cycle today. Man may be augmenting it, and I'm not saying he is or isn't, but climate always changes. And so be prepared the next time when this climate starts getting cooler.